So tonight, we're continuing biblical problem solving, how to receive divine wisdom. And this is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 16. So in, in the first chapter, Paul wrote about God's wisdom and salvation and God's wisdom in the people that he calls. And in both cases, of course, God's wisdom is foolishness in the world's eye. And the reason I think that's important for us to embrace is that when we're witnessing to people and they just either they either they dismiss us because they think we're lunatics or they have trouble understanding. Uh, it's important for us to know that they're not going to understand. You know, it's, it's something that has to be spiritually discerned. And so it's not for us to get frustrated. It's just, you know, this is where our patients come in. I mean, I'm talking to a young guy right now that has a lot of questions, and he wants to believe. He just, he's just he's struggling with the faith aspect of it. It's not that you're going to understand. You're not going to understand this whole book. Uh, there's some aspects you just got to take on faith. And that has to be... That has to be good enough because you trust who God is and that he's just and that he loves us and these things are going to work according to his will. So how to receive divine wisdom? First, resolve to find wisdom in God's word. And then so uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul begins with this, and I, brethren, when I came to you. So Paul's talking about his first visit to Corinth during his second missionary journey uh, when he founded the church. Paul was a great scholar and debater, but here in the, the rest of verse when he says that he he came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Uh, faith that depends on clever arguments or eloquent speakers will be destroyed when a better argument or orator comes along. Uh, we're seeing that in, in, well, we've always seen it in churches. There's some that are a little bit more um, charismatic, and for some folks that's a little bit more attractive. Uh, they, like, uh, the, they like the guy with a lot of energy, and you know now we've got the flashing lights and the smoke and I mean, I don't, I've never been to a rock show, but that's what they tell me it looks like, so I, I can't say. Um, but this is one of the reasons we see uh, some of our, our young believers uh, falling by the wayside, because when they get to college, these college professors, you know, they're, they're experts in their particular field. One of the things that really bothers me is that today's society, we look to athletes to be experts on whatever, you know, social issues, religion, and all these things. And, and it's not that they don't have a right to their opinion, but just because a guy can slam dunk a basketball doesn't make him an expert on the second coming of Christ, uh, nor does it make him an expert on, you know, the, uh, the budget or uh, border security and all these things. So you get someone that's uh, a so-called expert in a particular field, and it's easy to draw, especially young people, away because they're impressed, they're intimidated by the knowledge that people have. And, and you've met them. There's people that are very intellectual and they carry themselves, you know, in I would call it arrogant way. I don't know what they would call it. But I've also worked out at the Cape for 38 years. And I can tell you this. I've known some very, very, very smart people that can't tie their own shoes. I mean, you know, the old adage that, you know, they don't have any common sense. And so there's a lot to be said for that common sense aspect. But the point that Paul was making here is that he didn't come into Corinth and win these people with his oratory skills and rather, he won them with the word of God. Because, and here's the thing, I've been in churches where I stood there uh, when I was in Melbourne with a guy, and he pointed towards Brother Steve, who was our pastor, and he says, well, I'm here because of that man right there. And I just thought to myself, okay, well, that tells me, as soon as there's a problem with that man right there, you're out of here. You know, the reason we should be anywhere is because of our love for the Lord and that we believe that we're where God would have us to be. Uh, and that's how we should base all our decisions, uh, not on whether or not we like somebody. Uh, you know, listen, as likable as I am, <laughs> there, it seems like I do a good job of getting people upset along the way. Uh, but that can't be the basis. Personalities can't be the basis. What does the Word of God teach us? That's what's important. And so that's where we have to not fall for the excellency of speech and, and what have you. Uh, so... Uh, we just have to trust in God's word and, and not, just, not just trust it, but long for it, to desire that, you know, I want to know the truth. I want to know what I should be doing, how I should be living, and this is where I'm going to find it. 
Uh, I mean, there are commentaries, uh, and there's preachers out there that I listen to all the time that I, that I trust. But one thing I can tell you is I don't agree with 100% of the things they teach. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, I, who am I to uh, disagree with John MacArthur? Uh, I listen to him a lot, but there's one or two things I don't agree with, and it feels weird to go, ah, Brother John, I think he's just missing something there, but, you know, because the guy's a genius, you know, but you got to, you got to do what you believe the Word says. Uh, in his visit to Corinth, Paul wrote, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So therefore the Corinthians could not deny they came to Christ through a gospel that did not employ great oratory or human wisdom. Their salvation was based on the Word of God. This is why I say when we go to the altar, it's always best to have your Bible with you. If you're going to, someone's up there that wants to come to Christ and you're going to lead them to the Lord, take your Bible. I have the Romans Road marked out in mine. And I go to Romans 3.23, and, uh, and I work my way through. And I show them what the Word of God says, not just what Pastor D says, but this is what God's Word says. This is what we want them to base their salvation on, not on my opinion or understanding or what have you. So Paul's saying that, you know, I didn't come, you know, and put on a show for you. I brought you the Word of God. That's where your salvation is based. And so obviously that's where we want everybody's salvation both. So he goes on, he writes, uh, I was with you in weakness. So uh, weakness, they, they believe, is he's talking about some physical ailment or uh, disease. And so there's those that believe that his uh, thorn in the flesh, which is referenced in 2 Corinthians, uh, that tormented him was malaria. Others believe that it was a very poor eyesight. I've heard some other conjectures. Uh, and they, they, the eyesight thing, they, they look at Galatians 6.11. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. So a couple ways that you could look at this, either, either the letter was long, all right, meaning large, or the letters themselves were large because he couldn't see. So uh, again, I don't know how to uh, validate whichever. Uh, Paul preached the gospel in uh, physical weakness. Paul also came to the Corinthians in fear and in much trembling. So when Paul was in Philippi, he and Silas were stripped of their clothing and severely scourged or flogged and imprisoned. And then he, uh, then he had to sneak out of Thessalonica and Berea because the people wanted to kill him. So after all this, he comes to Corinth, and then any sane person would live in fear and in much trembling if they experienced what Paul did in these other uh, towns. So because of Paul's physical and emotional state, he writes, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So I think that we can certainly understand that when we think about the fact that Paul, uh, and uh, in this case Silas, had experienced some great opposition and uh, physical uh, abuse because they were preaching the gospel. And so in order to be able to continue uh, to do so in hostile territory, you know that's got to be through the Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit leading you. Um, because... I don't know about you, people flog me or stone me and leave me for dead outside the fence. I don't know if I'm going to get back up and walk into that town. You know, it's, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be a divine uh, leading of the Holy Spirit. And in spite of Paul's physical and emotional state, uh, Corinth exploded in response to his Holy Spirit empowered preaching of the gospel. Because of this, Paul could better understand what God meant when he told him the reason he had uh, to keep his thorn. So Paul, Paul, uh, Paul prayed in three times, and he asked God to remove uh, the thorn in the flesh. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I think that one of the greatest um, truths of God's words is that his strength is made perfect in weakness. Um, the physical, the mental uh, uh, capabilities that we lack, if we're doing what God has called us to do, if we're following the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will be able to overcome those things we will be able to accomplish far greater things than man would ever expect us to. And so that's why it's, uh, 
it makes you wonder sometimes. You know, there's uh, a lot of people I do believe that they sell God short when they sell themselves short. They say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that um, simply because they never had. But what they're failing to forget is that if, if God's put it on your heart, God's not going to call you to be a failure. God's going to call you. Now, don't get me wrong. There might be some lessons learned along the way, but uh, he's called you for a particular task, a particular ministry. And so in order to be able to do that, we don't want to sell him short by looking at us. Uh, or ourselves as an individual. It's always going to be me plus Jesus, me plus the Holy Spirit. That's how we're going to accomplish anything in this world that's worth accomplishing. So he says that, you know, my strength is made perfect in weakness, or uh, in other words, that the shortcomings that we as humans have, God will use us, as we talked last week about, you know, that he, how he calls, uh, remember uh, Peter and John in, uh, in Acts were referred to as... Uh, unlearned and ignorant men uh, but the the uh, Pharisees and scribes had noted that he had, they had been with Jesus so these were untrained men they were fishermen they didn't go to college they didn't sit under Gamaliel like like Paul did um, they were just common Joes uh, but they were doing uh, an amazing work for the church they were doing amazing work on behalf of Christ so uh, that being the one of the best examples that I could give you that when he takes the common and helps them to uh, overcome uh, the wickedness in this world and the prejudice and, and the arrogance and all these things that we deal with uh, as far as the word of God goes. I also think that, like in the case with Peter and John, that when the world around you, you know, might be high and mighty and arrogant and, and self-absorbed, uh, uh, but they see this ignorant person um, or this weak person, maybe maybe the person has a debil the, the ability of some kind, and uh, so they're able to overcome that for do great things in the ministry. I think the world's watching and they're saying, well, that's got to be the hand of God on that person because, you know, by themselves, how in the world would they be able to do that? So that's the things that we have to trust in. So what uh, what God did through Paul at Corinth is is a great example of that. So now we come to the verse that contains what my goal should be as as a pastor in uh, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Um, our faith should, uh, should be based on God's word and certainly not on the wisdom of men. Again, there's preachers that I listen to, there's uh, uh, commentators that I read, that I trust, but you know, again, I, don't, I just don't go you know, blind with them and just take everything at face value. You've got to have your own understanding. You've got to come to where uh, when you're questioned about it, that you're able to stand on your understanding. And that understanding needs to be uh, come through your reading of the Word and your prayer and your uh, being led by the Holy Spirit so that you can uh, work on these things or act upon those things. And so, uh, again, uh, but when we're experiencing the power of God, um, let me ask that question. The power of God. How do we experience the power of God? Anyone? In our daily lives, there's just uh, especially with me, I I'm continually on the go. And if I didn't have God's strength and help, I wouldn't be able to do it. Okay. Someone else? How do we obtain that? How do we obtain God's power? Yeah. So when we're, uh, you know, the Bible says, you know, be not drunk of the wine, but filled you know, of the Spirit, right? So uh, to be filled with the Spirit, we have to be engaged in that relationship with God through his reading His Word and through a prayer life and through corporate worship. That is how we um, keep the battery charged, so to speak, or what have you. Uh, to have a relationship with God without reading his word, without prayer life, without church attendance, without uh, a, an intentional pursuit of an understanding of his word, there's no power in that. That's just, at that point, you, you might say you're a Christian, but you're not pursuing uh, that relationship that will result in you performing like a, like a Christian. Um, how we speak, how we, how we do our business, and uh, are we demonstrating uh, 
characteristics uh, of God. Are we honest? Are we forthright? Are we um, uh, sincere? Do we have empathy uh, for others? Do we have sympathy and compassion and all these things? Uh, this is where, this is all through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and how we come to be able to uh, project those things. Not for the mere sake of projecting them, but to be able, look, for men especially, um, I don't know about you two, you three, but um, being sympathetic or uh, showing empathy, being humble, that's typically not what men do. Uh, typically men are prideful. Uh, we always want to be strong. We always want to, you know, present ourselves as such. Uh, we're not going to cry. You could chop off our foot and we're not going to cry. Uh, maybe tear up a little bit, but, you know, we're not going to let go. But to be able to have the power to be able to express ourselves that, in the manner that God would have us to, I don't think there's anything more powerful than someone when they're giving their testimony to an unbeliever uh, to be able to tell them what God has done for them and to do it with a tear in their eye. Um, a recollection of, look, I've been saved and this is what this means. I've been rescued from eternity in hell. And uh, that should be something that should be emotional for us. And so I think that there's, there's, there's different powers, a way to experience the power of God, uh, being able to stand up in the midst of uh, opposition. Maybe you're Maybe your family, maybe I don't know, maybe your family's all atheists or whatever, and uh, you're the only Christian in the bunch. Being able to withstand that uh, onslaught, that continuous attack of, you know, well, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that. And, and, uh, and again, I think one of the things that's uh, really intimidating for believers, especially new believers, is not having the answer, not being able to rebut those oppositions that, you know, we don't know how to uh, maybe refute a particular argument. But really, as long as we will trust in what we know um, and salvation in Christ and to have the, having had that experience of forgiveness and to be able to, to live on that, be faithful to that as a witness to, to others, then over time uh, it will have its impact. And certainly it's a, it's a uh, marathon. It's not a race. Uh, secondly, how to re receive divine wisdom. Realize it is reserved for those who love God. Paul has been writing about how he preaches to the lost and spiritually immature, but now he writes, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. That word perfect doesn't mean sinless. That word means complete. When Paul was among mature believers, he did speak words of wisdom, but not the faulty wisdom of the world that will come to naught. Uh, Paul explains, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. I mean, there's wisdom, obviously there's wisdom of man, maybe in mathematics or finances or medicine and all these other things. Uh, but again, those things will come to naught. Uh, I can go see the best doctor in the world and he's not going to be able to give me a pill that's going to make me live forever. I mean, he's not going to be able to cure me of, of, of all of the diseases out there and all the aches and pains and ailments. Uh, it's like I said Sunday, you know, I uh, our bodies are breaking down. I can hear it whenever we're standing or sitting in the church. You know, I hear popping and creaking and ooing and on and stuff. And, you know, so uh, I, I know it's true. I know it's a fact. And I don't know who's going to argue with that, but that's what happens. So, but there's things in the world that, you know, are worldly wisdom and not necessarily that it's a bad thing, but we don't want to trust, trust in the wisdom of the world for our eternity. Uh, the world, even the princes of the world, didn't know the wisdom that was of God. And this is where we get into this. Uh, Paul says in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of his glory. So the crucifixion proved the world didn't understand God's wisdom. They didn't know. Uh, uh, the Jews were looking for the Messiah. The Jews were looking for the deliverer. The Jews were told that... Uh, you know, he would be born of a virgin and all these things. And still, you know, Jesus goes walking by and it's like, who's that? You know, so they don't, uh, they don't uh, get it. Um, Paul was telling the Corinthians that pursuing this human wisdom puts them in the same company as the people who crucified the Lord that they claim to worship. So Paul begins in verse 9 by writing, but as it is written, and he paraphrases Isaiah 52, 15, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard 
neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So in this verse, Paul's not referring to the wonders of heaven, but I mean, it, it, it would fit. Uh, but Paul's referring to divine wisdom, the wisdom that God has prepared for his believers. And so I think what's uh, truly amazing here is that I think what Paul is saying to us is, is that we have not imagined the, the power, the splendor, the joy, the peace that we can have in this life, in this body, through our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. I think that's what Paul's trying to convey here, is that when we walk with Christ, uh, yeah, we still have our problems and all that. But I'll give you an example. I was sitting in the hospital room here, uh, I think it was Monday night or Tuesday night, with uh, a guy that uh, they come occasionally on, on Thursday nights, Bob and Barbara. Bob was in the hospital. And so I was sitting up there talking to him, and as I'm sitting there, I just realized that, I said, Lord, this is really a blessing. I'm enjoying this. You know, I mean, I don't know how many more conversations I get to have with this man, but uh, I really, really, I went home, I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, you know, with all the stuff that goes on, you know, all the trials and all the testing of my patients and all these things, I said, moments like that, I really, really just love it. And I think that's one of the gifts that God gives us, is that to realize when you're being blessed. Uh, one of the things I admonish myself for uh, daily, just about, is the fact that I don't enjoy life like I'm supposed to. I get too busy. I'm too wrapped up in this task and that task, and I don't take time to smell the roses, per se. And... I catch myself a lot of times saying, Lord, don't let me do that today. You know, I'm doing it again. I've gotten too busy. I've gotten, I've got all this stress and, you know, for, to for meet this timeline, meet that timeline. And re really the only one that set any timelines on me is me. And that's the silly part of it is that, you know, as soon as I get up in the morning, the first thing I do, I look at my, you know, phone to see, okay, what are you supposed to be doing today? Uh, and then, you know, then it starts. So, I think God being able to slow us down, take a deep breath, and then just realizing that, hey, you know, this is a special time. Take a minute, moment to enjoy it, and uh, just don't go speeding by it. Uh, this means the ordinary ways of understanding things. The eye, the ear, and mind cannot comprehend the wisdom of God. God only reveals his wisdom to them that love him. So how do you know if you really love the Lord? Well, this is how Jesus is going to describe it. We'll get there in a second. So God only reveals his wisdom to them that love him. Uh, and again, we're talking about that you just can't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. But this is what Jesus says in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. But uh, certainly uh, apply, both apply to any person claiming to love the Lord. Uh, I've always said, I think... I think God's word is simple, mostly to understand, but for whatever reason, it's not easy to live. And this is one of the verses that I look at, and uh, if someone's having a problem in their life, I will just say to them, you know, why don't you just do what the Bible says? When a Christian comes to me, and especially Christian couples that are having marital problems, and, you know, this one, you know, they're just, they've, they've left the word, in, in my opinion. Uh, well, if you love the Lord, and, and let's, let's put us aside for a second. If we love the Lord, then we're going to keep his commandments. And so his commandments said that you guys are married forever, you know, uh, at least in, in this world. And so just do what he says. Trust in him. Live according to his word. Keep his commandments. And these things will uh, fall into place as they should. Uh, I just don't understand I'll never understand the conversation that I have over and over and over again with people. And they say to me, I know what the Bible says, but. And, and I've had a couple conversations where I've said, and how's that working for you? Oh, it's not going good. Then why don't we keep doing it? Well, I think we keep doing it because we're yielding to Satan's uh, commandments instead of God's. In James 1.22, he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own 
itself. So let's let's dig into this one a little bit. Uh, what is a Christian? What's a Christian? Okay, we're partly there. What she leave out, John? All right. So, to get to where you guys are saying, we have to have repentance, right? So we repent of our sins and we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we do that through faith. Uh, and then once we have been regenerated, then we try to live for Him. Now that's key. We try to live for him. Uh, but I think that there's a misunderstanding with some people. They think being a Christian is making a declaration that I believe in God. I'm a Christian. Okay. What's that mean to you? I can't tell you how many times. You, listen, when someone tells me they're a Christian, usually the first thing out of my mouth is, where do you go to church? And I cannot tell you, it's probably, yeah, I'll say 60, 40. 40% 40 of the answers are, oh, I don't go to church. I don't want anything to do with organized religion, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, well, that tells me a lot right there because, number one, you're not loving the Lord because you're not keeping his commandments because we're commanded to go to church. We're commanded not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Um, so James says, be ye doers of the word. So when we come in, and sometimes I wonder, and, and I don't know, sometimes I think maybe I should put a public uh, service announcement on the screen while I'm preaching. These words are not for your entertainment. These are for your education. Um, because that's not my role. My role is not to entertain people. My role is to inform people, to educate people on how, what God's expectations are and how they are to live for him, how they are to keep his commandments, uh, because we are to be doers of the word. Uh, there's plenty of people I, I just, I'm afraid that they think come to church on Sunday, sitting there listening to a sermon for an hour, that they've paid their dues, and so that they're good for another week to go to heaven if something would happen, you know, God forbid. Uh, yeah, sure. just, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, my dad, before he got saved, you know, he would say things like, uh, oh, I don't go on Wednesday night. You almost not be doing Sunday right. You know, I don't go on Wednesday night. You know, I'm like, I didn't like that, Dad, but, you know, of course, preachers don't help it when they say, well, you got to come in and fill your tanks up. So, uh, But the point being here, obviously, is that you can hear a lot of preaching. Um, nowadays, think about it. You can listen to it 24 and 7. It's on that phone of yours, and as long as it's a smartphone. Uh, someone, you had a flip phone the other day. <laughs> okay, so maybe everyone but John can listen to preaching <laughs> 24 hours a day. <laughs> and so... Uh, so there's a lot of access to the word, but if you're, if you're spending all your time listening and none of it man, uh, manifests itself in, a, in an act of love towards another, then what good is it? You can know that Bible from cover to cover. You could have the whole thing memorized, but if you don't uh, act on it, if you don't, if you're not that extension of God's love in this community, then you're no value, more valuable than the guy that only knows John 3.16, but he's out there trying to feed the, the homeless or give them clothes or whatever the case may be. We don't want to mistake an intellectual understanding for salvation. To receive divine wisdom, uh, resolve to find it in God's word, realize it's reserved for those who love God, and rely on the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The Holy Spirit who dwells every believer is God's agent of communication and revelation. And so, uh, how do we talk to the Holy Spirit? And how does he talk to us? Okay, what else? Pardon me? Through the Word. Through the word. Okay. So through the Word and through the prayer. So uh, 
when we're talking to the Holy Spirit and we're asking him to lead us in a particular direction, how do we know it's him answering? How do we know? Anyone got any experience with that or, or what do you think? I mean, I don't know. Okay. All right. Good. Well, um, yeah, I think I, I think I know what you're trying to say, but yeah, the, your subconscious is not what I would be concerned with because I want to know what the Holy Spirit's saying to me. Here's what I would tell you about the Holy Spirit in my experience: if it's if it's something that the Holy Spirit is trying to guide you to, it won't go away. It will not go away. Um, he will be there every morning when you open up your eyes. He'll be there every night when you close your eyes. Uh, he'll be there every time you pray. And I think the Holy Spirit has a way. What we have to guard against is trying to speak for the Holy Spirit. You know, hey, Lord, you know, should I, should I really just bite the bullet and go buy that Ford Raptor that I, <laughs> that I lust after, right? <laughs> and, you know, well, honey, I'm going to pray about this. Well, I'm thinking the Lord's saying yes. <laughs> He's telling me you don't have faith. <laughs> so, but we got to be careful with stuff like that uh, because uh, we want to make sure if, if we're serious about responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then we got to be careful about how we receive him. And we want to make sure that we do it with a sincere heart. So the word revealed is the word from which we get our word apocalypse, and it means to unveil or to uncover so uh, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to us. And certainly, you know, as we read God's word and or hear it taught uh, or preach, the Holy Spirit works in your mind to uncover the re and reveal the wisdom of God. I don't know. Uh, we probably all have experienced it where you've, you've read a verse or a passage of scripture a number of times and then you're sitting there one night or whenever and you're reading and you're like, I didn't know that. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit says, let me shine a little light on this over here for you. Uh, and so you're like, oh, okay. Kind of happened to me today, as a matter of fact. Uh, human wisdom is unlocked by intellect, but divine wisdom is unlocked by the Holy Spirit through God's written word. But here's the thing. Uh, if you, I'm talking about you now, if you want to have an understanding of God's word, then you need to read it. You need to read it. Uh, me reading it and, and preaching, every time I get in the pulpit, I'm telling you I'm doing the best that I can to convey the meaning of the passage. Uh, but no one should take my word at face value. People should be like, well, let me go check this out. Let me go read this. And uh, Because I've had people come back to me before that says, well, what about this? And I'm like, ah, good point. Hadn't thought about that. Uh, so we need to be uh, we need to be searchers. We need to be reading God's word and, and not just for the sake of, and again, this is in my mind's eye. I think that there's a lot of people in the world, they think when they get to heaven, there's going to be a giant um, report card uh, in the heavens there and that every day of your life, you know, did you read your Bible? Did you pray? Did you do a kind act? And, you know, you, you know we're trying to check the, off the boxes and stuff. I don't think that that's going to be the way it is. I think that what happens is, is that as we live our life and God reveals uh, the truth of his word in us, that he changes us because he says old things become new. We are new creatures in Christ. And so the only way that that happens is we have to renew our mind. And to renew our mind, you've got to read his word. And so through the reading of his word, the Holy Spirit teaches us and directs us and grows us and matures us um, so that we can become this perfect or complete uh Christian, uh, because we will get to a point, hopefully we get to a point where our conduct is automatically Christian. There are some things that there are some things that when they happen, we have to stop ourselves and say, what would Jesus do? And then there are some things we don't even question it. You know, you're walking back to the car, you just left, left Publix and you realize that she gave you $5 back too much. Well, 
turn around, walk back, and hand it to them. You don't, you don't hesitate about that. Um, you know, it's just, uh, but there are things that we have to stop. And well, maybe we have to stop and think about five dollars. And I mean, I've gone back for like a quarter, but uh, you know, some people would be like, ah, they won't notice. You know, well, it's a quarter. Well, me, <laughs> my mind would be like, it's a quarter, man. Give it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably on the other end, though. But anyway, our human wisdom is unlocked by our human wisdom is unlocked by intellect. Our divine wisdom is unlocked by the Holy Spirit, and that only happens through prayer and reading of God's Word. And I do think that when we read God's Word, we have to do it with the Spirit of God. Change me, show me uh, the meaning, uh, help me to understand how it should apply, what it should look like in my life. Uh, what does that look like when D. Miller walks out into Titusville? What does your word look like on him? Uh, and then that's where we should, we, should, we should be living it. Paul continues, For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So only the uh, Holy Spirit can help us to understand the deep things of God. Paul explains this principle, says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Only we know what we're thinking. Um, there's nothing, I think, that can make me more irritated than for someone to try to tell me what I was thinking. Well, you were thinking this when you did that, weren't you? No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. <laughs> no, I wasn't. You know, that really annoys me because it's an impossibility. You don't know what I'm thinking. Um, it's the same thing with God. God's thoughts, Isaiah said, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? Uh, and so the only way that we can comprehend anything is for God to reveal it to us through the Holy Spirit. And as he does so, those are supposed to be the things that change us, that as our eyes become um, more open, that we should be even more um, holy and righteous in our, in our lives. I think that, uh, again, maybe it's just, just me, but I think that people run away from that word holy. Well, the Bible says, be thou holy, for he is holy. So I just don't think God would tell you to be holy if you couldn't obtain that. Uh, Matthew 6, 33, he teaches us, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. And these things that he's talking about were the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, and what have you. And so one of the things that I, I, when I watch and I see people who are struggling in life, I think to myself, I said, I wonder if they're putting God first. Are they really putting God first? Some people think putting, and Brother Randy Bryant and I were talking about this, the, you know, about a month or so ago, um, about commitment in the church of today. You know, commitment to me is I'm there when the doors are open. That's what I think is commitment. Commitment uh, as a believer is reading my Bible, praying, going to church, uh, going out and visiting, what, whatever the case may be, whatever, uh, whatever is on the slate for, for today, for however the Lord would lead me. But commitment today is, is different um, I think young people today commitment is simply to them one one Sunday a month is commitment you know I'm coming I'm coming every month what more do you want I want you to be there twice a week twice a week are you nuts you know um, and it used to be for for me it was like your Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night and whenever there was anything else going on uh, but commitment is different today. And I don't know that I have a good answer as far as what that means spiritually, uh, but I just know that it seems to be different. Uh, my idea of what commitment is is different than some than some younger people today. And I'm not saying that they're, I'm not saying they're wrong necessarily. I'm just saying, I think number one, I'm saying I don't understand it, um, but that doesn't make them wrong because I don't understand it. Um, I think they would be better off to be in the, in the Word uh, every day and in church every week. Uh, but again, uh, I think they fail to recognize the importance of their role in being here. Um, again, I'll go back to the report card analogy. You know, it's just not, you know, did you go to church in, you know, December of 2023, but uh, did you, were you doers of the Word? Were you doers of the Word? You know, yeah. 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 
That's an excellent way to put that, John. That's an excellent way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that that was that's excellent. I need to remember that. I heard Bodie Bachman say here not too long ago that when somebody would come and recommit to Christ, he said it makes me want to throw up. And you know, he used that principle right there. Uh, that, you know, like we're in charge of something. We're recommitting. We're saying, okay, God, I'm, with, I'm on your team again. Uh, no, you're either, you're either with him or you're not. You know, the Lord himself said, either you're for me or against me. Yeah. Yeah, relativism is is certainly alive and well in today's society. Uh, there will people will, people will argue with you that um, it's not stealing if I need it. I I was hungry, so I stole, you know, uh, a sub out of the Publix deli. You know, I needed it. I was hungry, but I'm still stealing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, your motivation to for sin does not come into the play. Uh, Paul goes on to say, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Uh, no one can know you as well as you know yourself, and you have thoughts, attitudes, feelings that no one knows but you. In the same way, no one can understand the deep things of God except as they are revealed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Paul wrote, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. When we come to Christ, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And he says that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God has freely given to us salvation and all its benefits through the death of his son on the cross. In the Bible, this is summed up in one word, grace. So one of the reasons the Bible says is that reason, one of the reasons we don't have stuff, uh, such as understanding, because we don't ask. What did James write? James said that if we lack wisdom, ask, and God gives it, you know, abundantly. Yeah, right. So why are there so many unwise Christians walking around? And, you know, because we're not asking, you know, and we're not asking with the right heart. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and again... I, I banner about this all the time, but the world has done such a good job at redefining that word Christian. Homosexual preachers. Uh, I just listened to MacArthur was quoting a lesbian preacher that had been appointed by, uh, I think it was the Presbyterian Church. I might have that wrong. Uh, you know, uh, the Christian who, listen, one of my biggest fears today are young people that are living outside of the marital covenant, um, pretending that they're married, having babies and all these things. Uh, because the, I think the danger in that is in society, you know, in society, they used to say, when are you going to make an honest woman of her? Uh, they don't even ask that anymore. They don't even, they don't care. Uh, and so when they do get married, or if they do get married, um, they don't view it as a sin. And you go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, and it says very, very plainly that fornicators and adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so when I talk to young couples, I tell them, I said, you've got to understand that this sin left unconfessed means that you continue on as a fornicator. And God isn't going to have that. And so I think what, what our young people today are faced with is a lack of accountability in a lot of aspects of their life, but certainly in their spiritual life. Because there's no one to hold them accountable. Mom and dad aren't living according to the, to the teachings of the, of the word. And so what scares me is that they adopt this, uh, you know, this worldly moral that, yeah, we're not hurting anybody. You know, it's just us. Well, it doesn't, there's so much damage being done in this world right now through those type situations. Paul continues, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
So the words taught by the Spirit to Paul and the apostles were written down and became what we call today the New Testament. So uh, what we have when we look at the Bible is, is God's inspired word. You know, different men wrote it, but God's the author. And so what I think about is so neat about Scripture is that sometimes I'll be sitting there reading something and I'll think, man, that must have been written 4,000 years ago, but it, it has meaning to, to my situation today. You know, it's like, it's like God, when he, when he dictated this, he just spoke through the ages, you know? I don't care if it's year B.C. 4,000 to A.D. 4,000, you know, it's, it's, going to, it's, it's words going to be true. Uh, so we need to, I think we need to hold God's word in proper, proper perspective uh, that it is his word and that he's, he took that opportunity to have it put down uh, so that we could understand who he is and, and what it is he expects from us. God's wisdom is concealed from unbelievers in this book, but is revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes. <clears throat> Here Paul writes, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Why? Because he says, Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is where I was saying earlier that uh, we need to keep in mind that when we're talking to an unbeliever, and um, and I'm not talking about an unbeliever that's uh, antagonistic to the word. I'm talking about even an, an unbeliever who who is searching. He's looking for answers in this life, um, and they just can't seem to understand it. Well, you're an unbeliever. There's just some things you're not going to get until you're you are a believer. Until uh, I think the, obviously the key word here is faith. You've got to. There's some so much of it you just got to take by faith. I think you have to start with faith and then let God grow your faith. Um, even the apostles, you know, when I think it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but when Peter said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my, forgive my brother? Seven times? And the Lord said, no, seven times 70. And then uh, the, the, uh, uh, the brothers or the, or the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Might, I think I got that right, but it might have been another situation. But anyway, whatever the Lord was telling them, it seemed to be a high standard to them. And they said, well, Lord, increase our faith. And so that's why I find myself a lot of times, Lord, I, I, I need you to grow my faith here. You know, I'm having difficulty being uh, surrendered to this right here. And so uh, help me to trust you. Because, listen, that's what it all boils down to. Do we trust God or not? Um, and the thing that I think really, really strikes me as odd is that there's a lot of these Christians, whether they are or not, um, they trust God to usher them into his kingdom when they die. But they don't trust him enough to guide them through their daily life. And that, to me, is a big problem. Uh, if I don't trust God to show me how to live today, then how am I going to trust him to take care of my eternal soul? That, that's a big issue. And I think that if people could just really, really uh, read his word, study his word, and come to the place where they fully trust and have faith in God as their Lord and Savior, Lord meaning the guy who's going to guide them every day you know, through this life that we've got to live. Uh, then, then now, now you got something to work with, and really, the the whole thing about it is that for the person you meet a person that truly and f and fully trusts in God, uh, they're usually very content people. You know what I mean? They're not. Uh, they don't seem to be people where there's a lot of drama in their life. Uh, uh, I'm not saying they don't have any, but I'm just saying that. They seem to be more content because they know that no matter what they're going through right now, uh, that it's through God's will and that they're a part of God's plan. And they're, we're, listen, we become a part of God's plan when we say, Lord, save me. Uh, be my Savior. Be my Lord. And so what we're saying is now, you know, take me and use me in any way, shape, or form that you see fit. Uh, and so when you know, God begins to uh, use you in a particular way. Uh, maybe it's through suffering. We talked about the other day. 
is that if through unjust suffering, such as nobody can top Christ as far as suffering unjustly in this world, but look at the benefits that happened because he was crucified, you and I now can enter into the kingdom of heaven by re being reconciled with God through that shed blood. So maybe, uh, maybe the, the personal hardship that we're going through or that God has asked us to go through, if we do it in such a way that we are a positive witness of God, uh, that we're able to do it with a uh, smile on our face or, or just a positive attitude or, or acknowledging God's power through it all, um, who knows who we're influencing around us family members that don't believe but they're saying wow look at what their faith is doing for them that's really carrying them through this period of illness or whatever um you know I, I've, I've talked before about you know when i preached Charmin's funeral uh Charmin was a girl that came here you know um 40 years ago and uh she died several years back as a young mom with two two daughters and had cancer for a long time and just her life for two or three years was just horrible and uh, her mom told me that her favorite scripture was John chapter 10. And I went and I'm reading it and I'm thinking in, in John 10, 10, where he says that uh, I came that they might have life more abundantly. Or, and, uh, and I thought to myself, I said, Lord, how is her life more abundant? Uh, and so I started kind of praying about that and just, Lord, show me this because I'm not getting it. And then it just hit me that uh, as I listened to her friends and family talk about the previous three, four years, whatever it was. And everyone had the same thing to say, was that she always had a testimony on her tongue and a smile on her face. And I went, that's the difference. That's the abundance. So there's a difference between going through the world with cancer and without Christ than going through cancer with Christ. And she was able to turn it into a witnessing opportunity. That's the difference. And so I think that even, even faced with something like that, there can still be peace and joy in our lives. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to talk to many believers that were dying. And, uh, and while they weren't necessarily excited about leaving this world, uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't fearful of what came next. Uh, I mean, I'm afraid of dying, but I'm not afraid of death. Uh, I mean, I don't want to die in a fire, and I don't want to drown, and I don't want to be a hero somewhere, you know. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, please, just one night when I'm sleeping, <laughs> just just wave me on over, you know. But uh, but as far as death goes, yeah. Uh, so regardless of their intellectual abilities, an unbeliever cannot understand the things of God. Paul continues, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself judged of no man. Those who are spiritual can understand spiritual things, uh, but they can't be judged or understood by unbelievers. And here's, I think, sometimes a, a pitfall that we, we fall into sometimes because we worry about what other people say about us or what they think about us. You know, they're, they got an opinion. You know, you're trying to live the Christian life and you're doing what God has uh, uh, instilled upon your heart and this person mocks you or accuses you of, of you know, being a Jesus freak or whatever. And, uh, and, and you get concerned about what, well, they don't know. They're talking about something they have absolutely no basis in order to have that conversation with you because they can't relate. They, don't, they can't engage. And so we need to understand that, that whether they're argumentative or, or uh, inquisitive or whatever the case may be, it's because they can't understand. Uh, it's just as difficult for unbelievers to understand us as it is for them to understand the Bible. Uh, they can't understand people who live by it. Uh, quoting Isaiah 40, 40, 13, Paul asks, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Apart from the Holy Spirit, no human can understand the mind of the Lord and teach him. It just, can't, it just won't happen. It's foolishness to think that a man can understand the mind of the Lord and be able to uh, teach man about the Lord's mind. In contrast, believers who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit can know the mind of God. Why? Because he says, but we have the mind of Christ. As a child of God, we are gifted the capability to know God's mind as he reveals it to us. Uh, again, you know, there's a lot of things in that Bible I think I understand. There's a lot more that I don't seem to have a clue sometimes. Um, but as God reveals it to me, then he, he teaches me more about him 
And uh, that's what grows our relationship. However, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to develop the mind of Christ in us. In Philippians 2.1, if there be therefore any consolation of Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is done as you read the Bible and rely on the Holy Spirit to help you understand what you need. This is called the renewing of your mind. To receive divine wisdom, uh, resolve to find it in God's Word, realize that it is revealed for those who love God and rely on the Holy Spirit. Let me go back just for one second here where he says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. What we, what we say in here is that we put other people before us. Uh, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Um, Christ put us first. When he came into this world and he suffered and died in the manner which he did, we were first on his mind. Um, when we are going through this life, um, yeah, I think everybody in here knows who Gail Sayers was, if I say. Gail Sayers was a Hall of Fame running back for the Chicago Bears in the, in the 60s. And uh, Gail Sayers wrote a book called I Am Third. Uh, even, and even in the book, he says that he wasn't a religious man, but that someone had told him once, you know, the Lord is first, my friends and family are second, and I am third. And he just thought that that was a good philosophy, you know, I am third. And, uh, and I like that. I like the idea that, you know, of course, you know, God should be first in our life because if we put God first in our life, we're actually putting everyone else, you know, one and one A because our relationships with everyone else in the world will not be as, as important or as kind or as loving um, as it will be if our relationship with God is right because the Bible teaches us how to interact with everyone. And so one of the things he's saying to us is that um, we don't want to be vain. We don't want our vanity to, to uh, keep us from helping others, from positioning others to succeed in the word. Uh, to uh, uh, when Listen, if a young person has an opportunity to uh, step up in the ministry, we don't want our arrogance, our pride to be the ones that say, oh no, you ain't, you ain't stepping in my pulpit or you're not stepping in you know, in behind my microphone. And, you know, I had a lady one time that got upset because so-and-so sang her song. Um, I didn't know you were a composer, but, uh, but, you know, that's the way we get sometimes. It's mine. This is my, this is my parking spot. This is my pew. This is my, uh, you know, my classroom, whatever the case may be. Do what? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and here's the thing about when you run into those situations, um, it's either arrogance or it's insecurity they need that title they need that position to feel like they're somebody you know what i mean so um yeah yeah I, yeah, yeah yeah well right uh because i and i've seen it in people that you know if you took away this or that they would be destroyed uh because they think that their value is in the fact that they can do this particular job and our value of course resides in the fact that God created us and that he loves us you know none of us need to be validated by any other human being because where our validation comes through is through uh, the blood of Christ through the Holy Spirit in our lives that's how we get validated and that's what should matter to us so yeah it's I, I do think that what happens is that we uh, we allow ourselves to get wrapped up in uh, the applause so to speak uh, one of the things that, be long before I became a pastor, uh, I remember looking, you know, every every Sunday the pastor stands back there and everybody shakes his hand and, oh, what a wonderful sermon you was and, you know, and all this stuff. And I remember standing, you know, I was just standing in the pew one day and I'm watching and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if he really appreciates what they're saying to him or if it's just, you know, building his pride. You know what I mean? Uh, I think I think one of the hard things that you have to do when you're a pastor or a singer or whatever, a teacher or deacon in the church, whatever, 
you got to be careful on banking anything on the compliments of folks. Uh, some of them are sincere. Some of them are uh, just, they think it's expected. When you shake my hand, I expect to hear you say, that was a good sermon. You really, you know, uh, well, I don't. Uh, I pray that, that God uses it because I know for a fact there's been probably three or four times in, in my life where during the week I'm trying to figure out, Lord, what am I going to preach on Sunday? I don't have a message. I don't have a message. And I'm trying to go this direction. And for whatever reason, the Lord just won't let my mind focus. He won't let me go there. And I end up going this direction. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is lame. This is, this is horrible. And I know the first time it happened to me, I'm in the pulpit preaching it. And I'm thinking to myself, you are laying an egg. This is horrible. And, uh, and I was just like, man, I'm glad this is over. And I'm standing back here, and here comes somebody with tears in their eyes. I really needed that today. And you're like, okay, Lord, I understand. You're in charge, <laughs> you know, because uh, I don't know what's going on in the hearts of everybody. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind.